Unlike all other creatures on this planet, we are the only ones who know that our time is limited. And this knowledge shapes us as humans. This feeling for the poignancy and transience of our lives has been at the root of so much of what we value in human culture. Throughout history, the awareness that our time is limited, that our life will eventually end, has driven humans to search for a way out. For centuries, religions have provided one. At the heart of religions, practically all the world's religions, there is the offer of eternal life, time without end. This is Wells Cathedral in Somerset. For the past 800 years, every Christian who's walked in here has been reminded that their soul is immortal. So I imagine that the promise of eternal life was a powerful incentive for the people who worshipped here. From their Bible, they knew that God controlled time. They read that Adam had reached over 900 years of age, and Methuselah, the oldest, he lived to be 969 years. So they knew God had the power over earthly time. And they believed that God could grant them an infinite life extension. It was essential that graveyards be placed close by so that the living and the dead were almost side by side. To the medieval mind, death was viewed as a, as a phase, as nothing but a natural continuation of life. The problem today, though, is that many of us are more skeptical. To get everlasting life in heaven, you have to trust that heaven actually exists. Speaking as a scientist, I think that there is a problem with regards to the afterlife and religious immortality, and that is there's no proof that it exists. Remarkable claims require remarkable proof. But maybe you don't need proof. Well, I do. This awareness that time stretches into a distant past has driven us for thousands of years to ask one of the greatest questions of humanity. When did time itself begin? In the 17th century, an archbishop from Dublin decided to find out. For James Usher, the beginning of time was the moment of God's creation, of the earth, the heavens, and all of humanity. So he started with the Old Testament. All Usher really had to do was add up the various ages of the patriarchs because the Bible tells us what age each person was when his son was born. So, for example, Genesis 5 tells us that Adam was 130 years old when his son Seth was born. Seth was 105 years old when his son Enosh was born. But at the end of the Old Testament, the family trees run out. Between that and the birth of Christ, there was a gaping hole in history. So Usher scoured the known world, looking for ancient historical sources to bridge the gap. Oh, it's extremely difficult. The Babylonians date or start their year in spring. The Jewish chronology starts in autumn, and the Greeks use Olympiads. So he has to bring all those different types of sources together and link them up somehow to, them, to each other and then to his biblical sources. For 20 years, Usher struggled to reconcile the historical records from over 10,000 volumes in his vast library. Finally, in 1650, he determined a date for the beginning of time with stunning precision. 
In the very first paragraph, Usher dates the creation of the world to exactly the evening before the 23rd of October, 4004 BC. James Usher had established the very moment of God's creation. Compared to our lifetimes, 6,000 years is an incredible amount of time. But around 100 years later, that time scale was about to be dwarfed. For all of Usher's library full of books, the Earth itself was beginning to present quite a different story. And the first man to realize it was a problem was a Scottish farmer by the name of James Hutton. Here he is. James Hutton spent most of his life marveling at natural processes, mainly on his own farm. And his investigations would lead to an entirely new idea of time. I'm about to look for the clues that led Hutton to rethink the age of the Earth and overturn Usher's 6,000-year history. Geologist Dave Thayer is going to be my guide. James Hutton's insights came from Scotland. But Dave's brought me to a place where the same features have been carved out on a much larger scale. Grand Canyon in Arizona. 270 miles of Colorado River flow across two states, carving out a chasm one mile deep. It's created a landscape on an epic scale. Let's have a seat here. And now, Dave, the Colorado River is a small little thing. How can the Colorado River gouge out such a huge canyon? The river is digging the canyon deeper at the rate of one foot every thousand years. Mm -hmm. And in that time, it's just all this rubble is eroding down into it from the rain. I see. You can imagine how long that's taking because it's all changing to sand as it goes. Wow. And how much rock has been carved out? Well, there's. 800 cubic miles of missing <laughs> rock in the it's Grand Canyon. Rock. A mile below us, the river continues to cut its path through the rock, carrying it away in its silty waters. So we're talking about the power of water, right? I mean, water, water carved this cathedral out of nothing. Yep, yep. And how long has this erosion been taking place? Well, at least five and a half million years is yeah, what right. they say. <laughs> Following similar clues, Hutton realized that Usher's 6,000 year age for Earth had to be wrong. Unimaginable eons of time were needed for water to carve out valleys. And Hutton noticed something else. The layers of rock revealed by erosion showed a still greater scale of time. Oh, here's a nice place to see the strata. The I see, the yeah, right here. Yeah, this red layer right here would be a siltstone that formed at the edge of an ocean. And you know, it took probably a thousand years to form one inch of it. A thousand years? Yeah. Oh my God. So you're telling me that Incredible. all of human recorded history, going back to the Babylonians and the yeah. Egyptians, would be just that much. Just a few inches. Isn't that staggering? Yeah. yeah. So this is like, uh, like a time machine, basically, right? Uh, a thousand years per inch on average? On average, uh, yeah. If you, if you just took the whole length of just the sedimentary rocks in the canyon that have been deposited here. Uh -huh. uh, Floods and rivers and streams and the ocean coming in. Yeah. Staggers the imagination. It right? does, indeed. As you walk down this trail, by the way, I wanted to tell you that, um, that every step you take, you go about 20,000 years into the past. <laughs> Is that right? Yeah. 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 And we've taken a, quite a few steps quite already, few steps. and there are a lot more steps right. taken all the way down to the river. <laughs> I see. Yeah. In fact, just six inches of the Grand Canyon's rock face is equivalent to Usher's time scale for the whole of Earth's existence. 
the Earth had begun to reveal the true immensity of time. A scale of time that was inconceivable. An unending abyss. For me, Hutton wrote a great passage which summarizes the experience of the Grand Canyon. And that is, the result, therefore, of our present inquiry is that we find no vestige of a beginning, no prospect for an end. The great vastness of Earth time had been revealed, and a scientific quest had begun. If the Earth wasn't 6,000 years old, then just how old was it? It's a question that has only finally been answered in the last few decades.